Okay, let's kick it off. So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, monthly webinar. So this month's topic is on building a prospect list. I know this is uh, some of the pain points of uh, my users and therefore I wanted to put uh, a great panel of experts on a subject coming from different horizons and different point of view, hopefully. So they'll be able to give us a, a comprehensive picture um, of hopefully how to build a great. prospect list. Uh, you guys are welcome to join chat.quickmail.io uh, in terms of, well, if you want to participate, answer any questions, or uh, answer any questions I, uh, I'm going to throw at you, uh, because I don't read the one on GoToWebinar. It's just not convenient enough for that. And you guys can talk uh, with each other. There is already uh, uh, almost uh, 50 people uh, on at the moment, and more and more are, are, are coming in. Um, so go ahead, join the chat room, and therefore you can interact with uh, our panelists. And that'll be super useful for the Q&A at the end. So uh, thanks guys for making it. And um, I think it's only fair to just start by presenting yourself. Um, here's a list of our panelists. Uh, we got Anand uh, from Lead Genius. We got Mike from Lime Leads. Uh, we got Ryan from Cellhack. And we got Sam from HustleCon Media. I'm just going to give them a few minutes so they can present their business a bit better. Uh, super pumped to have you on the, uh, on the show, guys. Thanks for coming. So, Anand, do you want to go to start? Certainly. So, my name is Anand Kulkarni. I'm the co-founder and president of Lead Genius. Lead Genius is a software solution for managing companies, outbound lead generation, list generation, data enrichment, and outbound email systems. Um, we have been doing this for about five years. Uh, the company consists of about 50 people here in uh, San Francisco, plus about another 500 who are doing research uh, globally. Um, we have run campaigns uh, for list generation, a whole bunch of verticals, uh, ranging from small business all the way up to specialized areas like construction, solar, all the way up to big enterprises. So we've had a good experience in seeing both sides of it. Um, behind the scenes, we watch a lot of the technologies that are coming out. So we're very excited to be seeing uh, what kinds of things uh, and trends people are talking about and sharing. And looking forward to sharing some of these today. Awesome. My name is Mike Holabowski. I'm the CEO at Lime Leads. Um, so you know, quite simply, we manage a you know ever-growing database of B2B contacts, specifically in the U.S. Um, and we built a really simple but powerful tool to search through those. So, you know, to give you an example of some of the ways people are using us this week, um, we had a, uh, a yoga software company, startup, come to us and say, we need to get in contact with every yoga studio in the U.S. So they go in, they find those contacts, they pay a fee, and then they can go about, um, you know, emailing them. Um, it's pretty much it. It's an extremely, you know, simple premise. Um, the UX is simple. That's sort of what we do. Um, we've seen companies, you know, ranging from solo founded startups all the way up to big sales organizations using us. Um, in the last few months, we're really transitioning from, you know, kind of trying to get everyone on board to really focusing on bigger customers. And we sort of eliminated our lower plans. And right now, you know, it, it's really just starting at like $500 a month and going up. Um, and the reason is we found that, um, you know, the larger companies that understand that it's, you know, really a numbers game are the ones that are having most success with us. Um, so that's sort of our take on, on the space, and that's what I hope to bring to the, to the table today. Nice to meet you guys again. Thanks, Mike. Uh, you want to go next, Ryan? Sure thing. Thanks for, uh, for having me here today. My name is Ryan O'Donnell, uh, co-founder of sellhack.com. Uh, we are a platform built for salespeople to automate their prospect list building anywhere across the internet. Um, our primary goal for being in business is we've all, or you know, when we started this, we, we, we felt your pain. And I'm sure everyone here on this call is here because you're affiliated with QuickMail in some capacity. You've gone through the challenges of building lists and data mining and, and you know, spending all day in Excel. And I think it's a really interesting panel here today. I think the, the four of us bring together, including Jeremy, who's, who's also an expert in the space, but I think we all bring an interesting perspective in terms of how we approach the problem that most of the folks on the call here dread, which is 
I need to make sales to grow my business. In order to do that, I think email is the correct channel to reach people, but in order to email people, I have to find them. So um, I'm curious uh, to learn from the folks on this call as much as to uh, share from our experience here. Thanks, Ryan. So basically, Ryan is the invisible man. He doesn't have his webcam uh, turned on. Um, oh, uh, Ryan, I'll just take a back seat. I'm just here for, for, for learning. I'm not going to participate. Um, cool. Don't be so, so modest. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sam, you want to go? <laughs> yeah, what's happening? I'm Sam Parr. I'm up in San Francisco. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called HustleCon Media. We have uh, a popular conference called HustleCon that happens every year. But our main business is our publication, which is called The Hustle. Um, it's a very email heavy based uh, media company. Uh, and basically, if we had to describe it in one sentence, it's as if Vice meets Fast Company. So we do lots of uh, really crazy things where we have people do drugs and then we test to see how creative they are, if their stress is reduced, or we'll have people live off Soylent for 30 days, or we'll, um, call, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, become a, a best-selling author just to prove that the Amazon Kindle game is totally rigged and stupid and no one should take it seriously. Uh, and so uh, I think right now we're one of the fastest growing media companies in the country, uh, launched in, um, in August, so like eight months ago. So that's who, uh, that's who I am. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Sam. So I guess we, like I was uh, quickly saying before the webinar starts, uh, I wasn't expecting everyone then to, uh, to come um, on board. So we don't have a lot of time per se, per person. So I'm going to dive directly into the topic um, and just ask for the, um, the first question. So those questions have been curated by, uh, uh, by a few uh, of my users. And uh, hopefully there is uh, a lot of value that you guys can bring uh, into answering some of them. So here's the first one. Uh, what's the best way you've seen people build lists and uh, what kind of quality can we be expecting? So the idea is that uh, some people don't really know how to address the list building side. And uh, it's kind of nice sometimes to think of other ways of out of the box. So some of the creative ways that you guys seen and uh, we don't have to do it in order. So if anyone wants to jump, then uh, then go for it. Otherwise, just name someone. All right, let's start. Uh, Sam, you're you're the hustle con guy. So, what uh, what have you seen for um, how to build list in a sort of creative way? Yeah. So we build. We add. Um, we're still pretty small, but we add roughly thirty five thousand emails a month to our list. Um, and they come from three, three ways. Uh, the first one is through website conversions. So if you go to our website, all of our pop-ups are really are pretty funny, um, and they convert at like our pop-up will convert at three and a half percent, and that's like our traffic isn't huge, but that's like seven hundred, eight hundred thousand visitors a month. Uh, so that's an alright number, and uh, it's because our pop-up is really silly and stupid. Uh, and so that's our that's one of our most creative ways is to increase conversion is to have a hilarious pop-up. Um, the second way that we get our emails is from our ambassador program, which I think a lot of people don't do, but they should. So basically, we it, it's a little more complicated than this, but we um, users if they open a certain amount of emails, we invite them to become an ambassador, and they get a unique URL. And then if they share with five friends, they become an ambassador, and they get t-shirts and they get access to our private group and things like that. Um, and so we, we've got another third, which is partnerships, but those, those two are our biggest ways. Um, and I think that most people really uh, don't sweat the details when it comes to the little small changes that they can make on their site that have actually big differences. Like, so for example, our unsubscribe page is really funny. And so we get a lot of people that resubscribe after seeing it. <laughs> But then also really small things like um, our welcome email is 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 totally on brand, and so people share that with friends and they subscribe. And um, our pop up is is on brand. So what we what our little hack or whatever you want to call it is all these little things that we do, um, or we do lots of little things, and they make our conversion rate for our website super high. Oh, you guys should check definitely check out the um, Tell My Boss Why I Should Attend the HustleCon page. 
I think this is totally badass. I'm going to steal that. What's which what which what, what, which one is here? You know the page where there is mention, um, you know, tell my boss why I should attend. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. This one is yeah. totally Yo, that's, that's another one. We get we get leads from that as well. We get emails from that as well. If you if, guys, if you haven't checked it out, you, you have to. If if someone would be kind enough to just paste the link into the chat room, that'd be awesome. Um, and yeah, I hey. Oh, sorry, Jeremy, Ryan, it, go for it. Sorry, it, if I could comment on that, I I think it, it's one interesting thing to take away from what Sam was talking about. Other than having awesome content, I'm not an ambassador yet, but I swear you guys are like my my nightly reading right before I go to bed. So um, good stuff. Keep up the good work. Um, one of the interesting things I, I took from what you said is is the way that people respond to how you communicate with them and the tone and the voice and the words that you use to them. So I think tying it back to the to the question here, um, how we've seen people be successful with with list building is, I guess, segmenting your segments, right? And as a business, you know who you sell to, you know who buys your product, you know who's you know who you solve a problem for, right? The mistake I see too many people making is uh, taking a broad stroke approach to building their prospect lists or doing their, their prospect research um, where the more optimized approach is segmenting your segment. So if you say, okay, the majority of our current customers are VP of sales, company size 50 to 200, for example, they live in the US, so on and so forth, that's fine, but you also have some customers who are CEOs of, of two people startups or uh, sales directors at 5,000 person companies, right? And I think you have to really take a step back and understand who these people are, not just their their demographics necessarily, like who they are when they go home, but what do they face at work? What are their challenges? What do their bosses care about, right? Is it is it hitting their numbers? Is it crushing their numbers? Are they, you know, trying to beat a Wall Street estimate? Are they trying to, you know, raise the next round of, of, of financing? Are they trying to keep their job, right? So I think, you know, segmenting your segments and really breaking it out when you're building your prospect list and, and focusing in on, you know, <laughs> focusing in on, you know, multiple segments at one time, when you go to send your emails, and Jeremy, I'd be curious as to your comment on this from what you guys see, um, when you actually go to send your emails, um, you talk to people differently because they care about different things. And I think that's been, that's been one way that we've seen people who've come in with a, I guess, machine gun approach um, start to have a lot more success with more targeted outreach. I'll pause there in case anyone wants to follow up or rebut or comment. So I think these, these two methods are actually fantastic um, from the perspective of inbound marketing, um, which is a tried and true way to drive list generation. Um, if you are in the segment of folks who can produce great content or funny content or engaging content. Um, the flip side, of course, is uh, outbound list building, um, which is what we see a lot of our customers come to us for. Um, which is basically saying something like the question in chat about, oh, I have roofers in the 90253 zip code, and I need to figure out a list of every single person. So the industrial strength way that a lot of these all-in-one solutions, um, are self-included, do this is by crawling big segments of public databases, right? So Yelp, Google Local, public websites, um, government databases like secretaries of state, um, compiling all that information together into one mega database that can be searched and then having human beings go through and clean up that information to make sure it's highly accurate and up to date. Um, and following methods like that, you can actually get really high quality um, in terms of the actual caliber of leads. Um, and generally when you're building an organization that is starting to do outbound at significant scale, getting those kinds of lists uh, at your starting point makes a big difference in your outcomes. Um, of course, if you are not at a scale where you would use a solution like this, um, you would probably think about doing a poor man's version, which is going and grabbing information from those sites yourself. Um, and you can do that. It stops scaling after a certain point, but it works really well uh, on a small scale. So if you use a tool like import, suddenly you start to want to get lots of information from lots of different sources. My up. Yeah, so you know, I agree. I agree with pretty much everything said. Um, you know, to Sam's point, nothing beats you know inbound organic leads. If people are finding your site and signing up for something, they're going to be in your you know uh, target customer um, you know profile, and that's the most important thing is like really defining and figuring out through experimentation like 
who wants this product, who benefits more most from this product, and then using you know any number of methods and tools to find those type of people um, is is really what it comes down to is is really understanding your customer base, um, not just having a broad idea, um, and and yeah, and just you know seg like uh, I, be I believe it was Ryan that said you know really segmenting your segments, getting really down to like who actually wants this and who actually finds value in this, and then going after those people. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. So let's move to the the second question. Let's say you know I got my list. I'm happy with that. Um, and let's say I got a huge quantity. Then the question that people have is that at what point you know how long is that you know the, the quality is a snapshot at, in, uh, at a certain point in time. So people will start bouncing after uh, uh, a certain time, like you know they change job and things like that. So. I guess how long can you expect a prospect on average to to be good and um, and to extrapolate a bit into you know how 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 long you think your list is going to be of high quality or how can you maintain that? Do you guys have any any view on that? Yeah, so we have a, a fairly quantitative answer to that. We measured this on behalf of our customers and um, adapted for it. So we have seen that customer CRMs. Uh, drop off in quality at a rate of about 5% every month. So that means each month that you have a list of contacts, people who are working at a company with their email address, who are on your target list, 5% of those folks are going to disappear and change jobs. Um, so it means year over year, you're losing about half your folks um, from your list. So the solution, the standard approach that we see companies take and customers take is to refresh that information on an ongoing basis. So checking each contact against one of the databases that we have in stock or uh, checking it against a bunch of um, external sources to see who has changed and who has moved. Um, and that is a little bit of work. Um, so for every company, it doesn't necessarily make sense to check every single month. Um, but it does make sense to do this kind of periodic refresh uh, at least once a year, uh, especially if you're interested in maintaining good conversions off the list. Yeah, sure. You know, the only thing you know I, I might add is that uh, it's industry dependent. For example, if you're selling it exclusively to startups, uh, it might be more than five percent. People are constantly churning. Um, but yeah, anything over you know a month or over a quarter um, just just seems like your list is going to obviously decay quite a bit. So um, you know, modern tools like us and, and Lead Genius obviously account for that. We you know we're constantly checking for dead emails and like removing them from our database. Um, it, you know, at this point, it's like they're obvious features. Um, but yeah, if, if you know if you're out there getting your own list, I mean, it's just good to refresh at least monthly. Yeah, and then the uh, I guess I'll I'll follow up there. Um, you know, all of our our emails are, are are sourced in in real time. So we have a a list building solution where you can pretty much you know tr build your list from from anywhere on the internet. Um, interesting thing that I just learned from Anand about the the five percent. That's a that's a, that's a great quantitative stat to take away there. Um, a lot of our clients and 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 me as well and and our sales team here um, we live hand to mouth, right? Which means that we have a daily sequence um, of prospect list building. So we'll build our list of of however many prospects per day, and all of those prospects immediately get you know, put into an email sequence. And that email sequence is anywhere from eight emails to fourteen emails that those prospects are going to receive over the course of the next two months. Right, um, some sort of engagement, and then if they don't reply after the, the first half, then they go into you know a, a non-reply sequence. So everything's automated. You can use a tool uh, just like QuickMail to uh, uh, to accomplish that. Um, but what we see is that you know because we have a, a much shorter window in which we we really go after and and get aggressive with uh, potential customers of ours and prospects of ours, um, we don't see a a large impact in in terms of uh, in terms of data quality going down. Now that being said, um, you know when we have new clients come on board, we'll off we'll often do a CRM cleanse for them. So they'll download their CRM, they'll upload their CSV file to us. Uh, we'll do a validation across all of their emails. We'll look for gaps. We'll look for good emails and bad emails. Fill in those gaps, and then typically suggest that either at, you know at least on a on a on an annual 
um, if it's not annually, then it's semi-annually and ideally quarterly that you're doing a complete refresh of your data. And if you've got a, you know, a tool like Line Leads, if you're using them or, or Lead Genius and, and they're automatically doing that, great. Um, if you don't have something like that, you, know, you can always find a third-party service that can help you get that cleaned up. But um, I'd be curious to see in the comments in the chat you know, uh, how long people are actually uh, keeping a prospect that they find today in their current contact loop until they either give up on them or move them to, you know, uh, a much, you know, wider gap um, between their last contact and, and the next time you reach out to them. So um, comment in the, uh, in the chat field, please. Okay, um, so let's leave it. Let's leave it for, like that for for this question. the The next one is um, what What are some of the mistakes that you guys see, or some of the pitfall? You you alluded to that, like the shotgun approach and things like that. Is there any other sort of pitfall that people needs to to avoid? Um, personal story here. I tried one of the um, an, um, a database um, prospecting database tool. Uh, I won't tell the name because it was so bad and I uh, had like 60% bounce. So I stopped it after, you know, after 50, 50 prospects. But um, what are some of the pitfalls that people need to, to be aware of and what makes, um, what makes the list uh, really strong in your opinion, guys? There are, there are two classic mistakes we see people making a whole bunch. And usually we hear about these stories for people before they come and talk to us uh, because we always advise against it. Um, the first is buying from these old school vendors who are basically selling picked over lists, um, lists that have been uh, unverified for a long time or where all the people in there have already been contacted and they've learned to ignore anyone who emails them. Specifically, data.com and Hoover's are the two worst offenders for um, sources of, of information like this. Oh, all right, if we say uh, names, and I'm going to say lead ferret, never ever use them. They're, they're rubbish. Yeah, there's a lot of really small sort of fly-by-night vendors also who have, who have cropped up. Um, I don't think anyone who is here is in that category, but um, uh, you know, a lot of the older, bigger ones are the ones that people often make mistakes with. Um, I think the second pitfall that you have, happen to see a lot of is people who are contacting far too broad a segment, um, which gets into the point that, that Sam and Ryan raised earlier about not sub-segmenting enough. Um, for example, thinking about a category like roofers in a certain zip code, that is precise, but it may not be precise enough for um, a given uh, buying decision to, make, to take place. It's not just about the firmographics, meaning the the location and the size of the company that you're trying to talk to or the customer you're trying to talk to. It's also about finding the triggering event that will actually define a buying action that will take place. So this is usually something that you might be able to find about a company like, oh, they just had some recent event in their past that um, suggests they may use your product. One that we see a lot is something like, um, do they have a job opening that might use your product or, or service? Um, if you don't look for characteristics like that in a list, um, you can email a lot of people and they might look like they're right from the outside, but they won't really have an interest in buying what you're selling right now. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, to the first point, um, if you, you Google and search, you know, Google for, you know, database of US business to business contacts or something and there's a database of five million for five hundred dollars there's something wrong with it um, so you, you know and and uh, you know most importantly is you know email deliverability at a high level uh, you can run lists through something like bright verify or kickbox to get a general idea like you know is is this is this list better than 95 percent deliverable right it's pretty important um, and, and again, you know, the, the point we keep talking about is just, you know, how specific is your list um, and how likely are these people to buy? So, you know, um, sales is all about context, um, you know, what's, happen what's happening within their organization uh, at the moment, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, it's fairly common sense in terms of, like, if a list is, just seems too good to be true, um, you know, don't go for it. Sam, Ryan? One thing that that we've we've done so in terms of you're you're talking about doing like a broad audience. Um, a lot of times we'll be extremely transparent in the email. 
so we've run a bunch of tests where we've done math. We've, we've had a, a big old list that we were trying to contact and convert them to do something. And when we tested a uh, different language, the language that won was saying like, uh, uh, telling them how we found their email uh, or kind of some strange things like that has, has worked significantly better than uh, just sending them the, the typical email that we'll get if we don't buy a list. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. Like, uh, found, your, found your email on this website. I know this is out of the blue. It's super spontaneous, but I think you're the right person for this because of this reason. And the response rate is significantly higher uh, when we just did the typical shit. So, so what you're saying, Sam, here is basically the prospect list quality is only linked to the context of how you contact them. And what you say. Mm. Yeah. Big time. Yeah, I, I, you know, to, to quickly close the loop on this so we can get to the, the next question here. Um, you know, I'm more of a, so first, anytime, if you get an email from someone and it's like US marketing 123 at gmail.com and sounds something like, you know, hi, um, you know, please reply back and let me know. You know, we have a database of 11 million contacts. Let me know which industries you'd like. And it's like the most, it's, it's generic and, and there's poor grammar. And I could, I could probably post an example of it here. Um, stay away from those, right? Um, if you're going to buy a, a, a list or you're going to work with someone who has a, a, a database, um, I think one interesting point either Anand or, or Mike brought up was, um, you know, going to the old guard data vendors uh, and, and buying the same list that everyone else is buying, um, chances are your market segment is much more broad um, than, than what's been already prepackaged up in something that's been resold many times. Um, just something to think about. But, you know, ultimately, I, I think what it comes down to, once you get to um, the point of having, you know, valid contact information, for example, the quality list is, is the quality of the list is subjective. Um, the strategy of your campaign and the voice in your in your messaging and actually being able to get their attention and get a reply, um, it, in my opinion, it you know has has a lot more value um, to actually getting to a demo or a meeting and ultimately closing business. Yeah, so it's a critical point. It's basically a list could be of very poor quality for one type of person and it could be of really high quality for another one depending on what their market and and uh, and their communication. Right, and if you're going to spend a lot of money on, if you're going to, to really invest in, in, in spending money on, on paying someone to, to help you build lists for you or find highly targeted folks, um, that's fine, and, and you can quickly test what the return on investment there is. Um, but at the same time, there's also a hedge to that bet, where you know you can do your own list building and and spend less money. And I think that the combination of of, of both of those um, both are are you know can be advantageous to you. I know for a fact that we have we have some clients who also use Lead Genius. Um, I don't know about Lime Leads, Mike, so I, I, I can't confirm that. I'm, sh I'm sure they do. Um, but we've definitely seen folks who are using CellHack who also use other, um, you know, other technologies or, or, you know, um, or a list broker um, like, actually, I don't want to name a name. Data.com was already said. They'll use a data.com. But they'll, they'll combine different approaches um, and figuring out, you know, what's the right uh, combination of all of those that ultimately is going to produce a machine that keeps the top of the funnel full and money coming out the back end. We see this a huge amount as well. A lot of our customers are using four or five different tools at different parts of the sales stack um, right. and plugging them all into the same framework to try and uh, get an effective end-to-end -end solution. Cool. Thanks, guys. So I guess the next question is about um, you alluded to that at the beginning and then into saying like, you know, it becomes a bit geeky and stuff. Um, what do you guys see um, is the latest trend in list building? Um, I think we slightly touched onto that, but it'd be good if we have, um, if we talk again about this specifically. And what do you think is actually dying um, at the moment? 
So I think there's been a clear trend uh, in the last two years especially towards what they're calling the sales stack, which is this idea that you're using a suite of data-driven technologies to try and aggressively automate different parts of your sales infrastructure and make your salespeople very high productivity. Um, I think the trend that is really sort of the latest and greatest of 2016 is this rapid shift of everyone to account-based selling, which is this idea that you can invite every single potential buyer in your entire space as a list of named accounts and then market to each one of those accounts directly. I think we had a question in chat about um, how you would do this at the enterprise level. This is exactly where it would happen at the enterprise level. You figure out exactly the 2,000, 4,000 companies that are probably going to be your target buyers, figure out 10 or 20 different potential contacts with each one of those companies, and then start your list uh, engagement in that way. What's dying out are these old school vendors. Um, the old school way used to be you'd start as a new details, you'd buy Salesforce, then you'd populate it with data.com data. That is not really an effective mechanism given how picked over that list tends to be. Brilliant, thank you. Um, who else wants to go on this one? Oh, we lost Sam. What happened? So he didn't like the question, so he decided to just uh, skip this one and use his joker. So hopefully he'll be Yeah, back. so uh, Jeremy, uh, I'll come in on that um, quickly. The the trends that, that I'm seeing, and, and we've been in business for about two and a half years now, um, the level of sophistication of our buyers and our our prospects and and our customers um, has significantly ramped up. Um, you know, it used to be that that you know folks would go to, you know, they would either get lazy and 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 you know buy a list from someone who randomly sent them an email, um, and they'd spend a ton of money for that, and and this was handled by the marketing team who would hand over the Glen Gary leads to the sales team, and 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 they they try to close them. Um, what we're seeing is, especially when I do demos and, and have someone share their screen with me, um, the number of uh, the number of extensions that folks have, um, you know, bolted onto their browser and the different times, um, you know, throughout the sales stack that that or the sales process and and these extensions to make up their sales stack, um, the level of sophistication and things that people are doing is just uh, has been mind blowing. Um, so I think technology has has really started to pick up at least over the last two years, and and the opportunities for folks out there who are trying to generate you know new sales for their business. I don't think there's, or I have I've never seen a better time where there's been you know more things to try that can make you more successful in a more efficient manner. <clears throat> Mike, can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so, you know, really, you know, what I, I believe things are trending towards is, you know, this idea that if you are going to cold email or cold call someone, you better know what you're talking about and you better have a, you know, a justifiable reason for contacting them. Um, and what that comes down to is really knowing about their business and knowing about the context of their business. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sure you guys have gotten at least one cold approach um, in your careers where you, where you said, wow, okay, this is genuinely useful. I, I do want this, and you go through with it. Um, and so this idea of just, like, mass emailing, you know, tens of thousands of people at a time um, and hoping that some percentage of them convert, I, I believe is dying out. Um, and, I mean, I hope it's dying out because, it's, it's, you know, it's incredibly annoying. Um, so yeah, I mean, in general, there are all these tools like like you know like ourselves, these modern tools that are bringing more and more technology in the space, um, and and allowing for you know for outbound salespeople to to really get educated, and and they have to be, they they have to know that the companies they're reaching out to genuinely um, will genuinely find value in whatever they're trying to sell to them. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um... So I think we're going to have to pass for some, um, probably have an internet connection problem. Um, he may come back. Um, the, the next question, I think um, I'd like you, um, Ryan, to start on this one because you just mentioned it, like, you know, people are having more and more, uh, are more and more um, relying on technology. Do you want to, to, to tell a bit more about, about that specifically? Yeah, the, the, the notion of, of the sales stack 
and and I'm not trying to steal your thunder on that, but it, it's a it's a very relevant point to bring up. Um, I mean, technology is doing for for sales professionals and and startup founders and and people who make their living generating business from people that they've never met before uh, through the internet. I think technology is as it, it's just it's comparable to the industrial revolution. Like we are going through a revolution. Um, we don't have to, you know, sit around and, and live all day in an Excel workbook and and try to, you know, it used to be back when I was trying to guess email addresses before we built CellHack. Um, you know, we'd go in, we'd figure out what the emails could be. We'd put one one email address in the two field and then, you know, eight emails in the BCC field and, you know, hope that one of them would make it through and, and, and it would look okay, right? When we take the seven the seven that bounced out and basically be able to figure out in five to 10 minutes, you know, what the person's email address was. And it, it's just like today you could figure out an email address within, you know, a couple of seconds. And, and it's just, it's absolutely mind blowing what it does. But I think all technology is doing is, you know, allowing folks to, you know, just be a heck of a lot more efficient with their time so they can spend less time on these kind of manual tedious processes and more time in front of customers, um, you know, giving demos, pitching, negotiating, and ultimately generating more revenue. Awesome. Anand, do you want to also give your view on the technology side? Absolutely. So I, I completely agree with Ryan that we are going through a revolution. Um, and I actually talk about this as being one of the best times to be in sales and marketing because we have so many tools that are coming out for the first time to make our lives much easier and, as we said before this seminar started, geekier. Uh, I think that the thing that um, technology is changing here um, is that we have uh, players like ourselves, line leads, and others who are consolidating big parts of the web together using a lot of crawling technology and getting a lot of the information that companies are putting out there on an ongoing basis and putting it into one place. Uh, and I think that makes things a lot easier for consumers of these kinds of uh, sales products because you can just walk up to a company like one of ours and say, hey, give me every company that looks like this in this market that has properties A, B, and C. And that wasn't possible without technology. There are even tools that are uh, as simple as a Chrome extension that lets you do subsets of this um, sort of on your own, whether or not you're working with a big company. Um, to get this done, you can still get a big part of this uh, solved, um, even by using a lot of the tools that are coming out uh, on an everyday basis. Yeah, so I mean, um, our entire game plan is that technology plays a whole, a huge role in list building. I mean, that's that's what our company does is we build technology for list building. Um, so you know, um, obviously there are more and more modern tools. Um, what we've been focusing on, and sort of what our, you know, one of our core ideas is to lower the um, the, the sort of barrier to, uh, barrier to entry to becoming like a, a a really educated and powerful list builder, right? So, um, and, and you know, so sort of all of these companies are doing that. Whereas, you know, um, we constantly get customers coming to us who have never built a list before ever. Um, you know, sort of smaller companies and. And now we can hand them this like really easy to use platform where five, ten years ago they'd need a team to accomplish the same thing, right? And and really like an intimate knowledge of outbound sales. Um, and you know, I mean, again, quick mail's in the exact same boat, right? You guys are really lowering the barrier to entry to, to you know to and empowering people to to reach out to you know thousands of people at scale, right? To, to scale authenticity, as some as some companies say. Um, so yeah. A huge role, um, and and you know the panelists here are obviously, uh, you know, leading that 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 drive. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, guys. A sort of follow-up question, uh, actually, on this one um, has been done on um, go to webinar again. You guys should come to chat the quickmail.io so everyone can participate. But one of the great question is, uh, can you actually give an example of a wholesale uh, sales stack? And you know, I don't mind you guys mentioning my competitors. It's not about quick mail today. Uh, it's really about how those folks can, um, folks can actually create their own sales pipeline. So if you want to mention a competitor, it's all fine with me. Don't worry about that. But could you guys give some example of an entire sales pipeline? Or what you've seen working? 
I'll not worry. Sure. So I can I can comment on on one that um, or something that I might think of as typical inside um, an established sales organization. So um, there is a, a feedback loop here that goes from sales on one side all the way through to marketing, and hopefully to the people who are talking to your customers after they buy your product too. Um, and automation technologies are showing up at each part of that, but. You can generally divide this into um, the people who are coming up with the companies that you want to go after, basically your accounts identification, the people who are figuring out the contacts that are actually in those accounts that you need to communicate with, and then um, the folks who are re-verifying that information um, on an ongoing basis, and then the folks who are actually um, doing the email automation, the email cadence, and the engagement. Um, so usually companies will be purchasing data from um, one or more sources. Sometimes they are coming to a actual lead generator, like Lead Genius or Lime Leads, um, or sometimes they're buying data from uh, a third party, like um, one of the ones we've, we've mentioned so far, and plugging it into a tool like ours to sort of clean it up. Then you add in the contact data. Um, again, you're either going to buy that from a vendor like uh, like us, or you might, um, if you have your own email derivation solution that can do some of those things grab that information from someplace else. And then, of course, you've got something that checks that data on an ongoing basis. Um, there's a lot of contact databases out there that try and check social networks. Um, or again, you go to a provider who does it for you. Um, and then last, you have the email automation side, right, which is something like QuickMail or Yesware or Tout or um, even we have an email product. I think there's one coming out just about every week from uh, some of the smaller players. But um, you know, there's uh, uh, I think quite a bit to be said for some of the, the more mature ones here, like QuickMan. Hey, thanks, Anand. Um, Ryan, you also seen some um, a lot of cell stack, right? Do you want to comment on some of them you've seen? I'm going to stay really low level on this, and, and I'm going to talk. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to talk to the folks out there who who have nothing and tell you how you can, and assuming you have nothing set up and you don't want to spend a bunch of money or, or use a lot of different tools that can add complexity to what you're doing. So I'm going to give a really low level sales stack that could work for you. Um, you need first, first thing you need to do is, is figure out um, who's your target customer. And the best way to do that is look at your existing customers and then figure out what characteristics uh, they're made up of, right? Industry, company size, title, location, so on and so forth. Um, next step is go out and find them, right? Um, once you find them and you build your lists and those lists have you know, ways to contact them, um, and we'll focus in on email primarily, um, then you need to go and find a solution uh, like QuickMail, who's actually gonna deliver the emails on your behalf. Um, the one step before that is, is of course, writing your email sequence, um, which you know most folks give up way too early. We suggest you know eight to twelve to fourteen emails, A and B variations that you're testing. Um, but again, that's a deriv that's a that's a uh, a tangent. Um, so build your build your segment, find your prospects, find a a service like QuickMail that can actually send your emails. But then you have to deal with people who are are replying to you. So you can manage this in Gmail. If you use QuickMail, um, it, I'm assuming you probably use Gmail with it. Um, QuickMail is going to continue to send your email sequence out to the people if they haven't replied to you. But once they reply and you're taken out of, uh, and, they're, and those contacts are taken out of your sequence, then it's on you, right? So the one mistake I see a lot of people making, they'll come to me and, and they'll say, hey, I need 10,000 leads. And I'll say, great, what are you gonna do with 10,000 leads? You know, and they're like, we're going to email them. I say, okay, you're going to email them, and then let's say you get a a a 20% reply, and you have 2,000 people emailing you. Do you have the team that can manage that? And they say no. I say, okay, well, um, then let's start with a bit fewer, right? Um, but once you start getting replies coming in, um, there are a couple folders that I suggest people create in their inbox, um, and 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 that is, you know. Um, Replied interested, replied not interested, scheduling meeting, uh, trial started, trial not started, um, trial ended upgrade, trial ended no upgrade, right? So at a really low level with those components, what you basically just built is um, a CRM or a pipeline management system 
that doesn't involve learning a CRM or, or, or getting into the weeds of constantly updating a CRM. It's, it's, it's hand to mouth, it's not ideal, it doesn't scale, um, but there's a really efficient way of when you're first starting out, like trying to figure out whether or not email is, is, a, is a tool that you should use to close new business, getting really organized with how you manage your labels and your folders inside of Gmail, um, is, is one step I would, I would strongly suggest. Once you figure that out, in my opinion, then it makes sense to go into a CRM or a pipeline management system because you already know what, se you know, what different you know, segments of your pipeline you need to create. Um, one of the worst things about a CRM is spending a ton of time setting it up and deploying it and then figuring out that all the assumptions you made are incorrect and you're constantly going in and moving people you know, into, into one category or the other. Um, but I think for folks who are just getting started, there's an, an easy kind of low level way to manage this in Gmail and you know, figure out what the optimal process is before you add process and technology on top of that, um, which ultimately is what you're gonna need. And these are all, you know, these are all components of, of, of you know, various levels of maturity in the sales stack. Sure. Um you know, what I think I can add is, uh, you know, you touched upon like the whole uh, beginning process of, you know, finding the emails, getting people and sending out them. What I think I can add from, you know, our own experience is, you know, how to convert these people to actual paying customers. So when we first started out, we had, you know, this huge database and we just send people to our database. Like, look, you can look through like 12 million people on our platform. People got lost and confused and, and generally bounced. Um, so what we started doing is we started segmenting our product offerings um, and we built, you know, this page, uh, Lime Lead slash Explore, which I posted in the chat. And there are these dynamically generated landing pages for, you know, every sub industry we offer. So now, you know, um, as an example, you know, um, we have a bunch of construction companies on our platform. So we can now send, send people directly to that and, and, and offer them the super customized page and it really looks like, you know, we focus on construction companies. Um, so, you know, really, you know, it, it comes back to, you know, sub-segmenting sub your, your, your prospects and, um, and, and having some, you know, a, a ready, a, a, a piece of your product that is, you know, directly specific to, to what they want. Um, yeah. Awesome. Two more things I want to mention. The first one is, no, I didn't pay Ryan to mention quick mail so many times during this cast. And, uh, <laughs> and the second one is, a lot of people mention Streak as well as their CRM in Gmail in terms of uh, a free software uh, to use. To oh, my God. Hey, mail. Jeremy, can I jump in on Streak? Can I tell people how yeah. awesome Yeah, Streak sure, is? absolutely. Okay. Um, just really quickly, and they're not paying me either. Um, <laughs> Streak is... Whether or not you use their CRM, which we do not use their CRM, um, and it's not for any, any reason other than whatever, we, we don't use their CRM. They have their snippets is, in my opinion, one of the most powerful things that I have in my inbox. Um, you know, I support, you know, some of our technology. I, I'm on the ground every day. You know, I answer questions with folks. I, I, I prospect. I sell. I, I do everything. Um, I, I touch every component of our business. I couldn't do it without Streak. When you find yourself answering the same question over and over, or, or let's say someone replied to you and you've sent them two emails and they haven't replied back to send uh, to set up a demo, um, I have I have five email templates set up. And, and the nice thing with streak is, is you can create like a key, like a keyword. So anytime you type that keyword, um, the, the body of the email that you want to send is just automatically going to be going to be put into that, Got that, it. that email container. So it's just from a productivity standpoint, um, you know, when you're saying the same things over and over, as soon as you notice that use streak, it's free to, it's, it's free to create the snippets. And, and it's super simple to, to reply in a very personal manner, but not have to type the same three to, to 10 sentences every single time you get a, a question or every time you're, you're writing the same follow-up email to the person who hasn't replied to set up a demo yet. Short plug, but it's a very effective tool we use. Uh, it is, it is. We're slightly di digressing from actually list building, but uh, I think there's plenty of value there anyway. Uh, next month, we're doing the sales webinar, so maybe you guys want to come again. That'd be awesome. 
Um, anyway, uh, let's go to the next next question. Next question is quite interesting um, because that's a lot of you know a lot of the very um, new companies in this domain and you know like on on the forefront of the technology they always come from America and I've seen that with QuickMail as well. The adoption from American users has been way faster than the Europe European one. Europe slightly comes to it, but the, the US were like, you know, very early adopters uh, very, very quickly. Um, but I guess one of the questions that comes from my users coming in uh, from Europe as well is, hey, those, you know, those tools that enabled us to, to find a lot of prospects, um, they're all very US centric. And sometimes it's hard to get the same quality of prospect in Europe. Do you guys have any opinion on that or, or anything that you, you can contribute to this? Yep, so I'll add um, a couple of remarks. We serve customers in the US, but we also serve customers who are targeting Europe, Australia, and to some extent, parts of Asia. Uh, the main thing to look for when you are thinking about engaging in these campaigns with companies uh, who are in those groups um, is to make sure that whoever you're working with and whatever practices you're following are compliant with the data protection and uh, email communication rules in those countries. Um, where we have seen people who have gone about this without thinking too much about it uh, get burned by people who are sort of dumping them contact lists of European companies and encouraging them to mass email them without thinking. Um, the US. Uh, leaves a lot of the email communication infrastructure to spam providers, and so you think about deliverability. Uh, in Europe, this is taken very seriously. So if you are contacting people, you should make sure that the vendors that you're working with are helping you uh, uh, with the compliance side of it, and not just the, here's some people you can contact side of it. Um, just a quick quick one on this one, and then do you think it's because the US is well known with the Can, you know, can Spam Act, or uh, do you think the difficulty comes from that, that the US is really well known with the Can Spam and the Europe not quite so, or do you think at the end, you know, there's, there's really way more difficult in Europe? No, I think it's that people have thought a little bit more about it in the US side. Um, I think there's just, there's been less uh, thinking about these questions um, when customers are targeting European companies. I think you also see less adoption of the sales staff in Europe and Australia. Um, but I think that you will see that change in the next four or five years, uh, yeah. because obviously these techniques are, are important to automating sales processes. Cool. I don't have too much to add here. Uh, yeah, Lion Leads focuses exclusively on the US um, as of now. So that's sort of our specialty. Ooh. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> What about you, Ryan? What about Europe and Asia and all the parts? Of I don't Europe? have a, I don't have have much to add in terms of uh, just I don't see a difference. Um, our, our 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 clients in in Australia or or Hong Kong or you know Germany they are are, mm. are really no different than than um, those in the U.S. I mean they they're doing the same thing. They know who they would like to contact or, or what their ideal prospect looks like. They use our technology to go out and build lists of, of lookalikes or people who fit that segment. Um, but they always ask me, you know, do you guys have, uh, are, are you international? And, and my answer to them is yes. And, and then our conversation is, is pretty quickly, like the whole international, the international component of our conversation is over at that, at that point. So I don't, I personally don't see a, a big difference in it. Do you think, guys, then, or do you think, Ryan, it's more in the mindset, um, um, in the mindset rather than the actual act? Can you ask that differently? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I realized after I asked, I said, oh. Uh, no, I mean, do you think it's the mindset of people coming out of US that is slightly different from the US uh, people? And that's what makes it uh, that what makes those questions and those uh, anxiety around you know is there a big difference? Are you guys international and things like that? I'm in, I'm going. I don't know. Um, I will ask that the next time I get the question. Um, <laughs> I, I will ask them why they are asking me that, whether it's from past experience or 
or, or, or just, or just new to this and, and may, and may think that since a lot of the technology related to, you know, what we're all doing, a lot of it's coming out of the U S not that it's U S only, but, um, maybe that has something to do with it. I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, no, that's fair enough. No worries. And you, Anand, do you actually, um, do you actually think the, your European uh, clients have a really drastic different mindset than your U S clients? I think that European clients are just a bit um, slower to have received a lot of the, uh, the gospel around sales automation technologies in general. Um, I don't think there's a fundamental difference in how these companies are going to adopt these technologies in the next five years. I think we hear a lot about it here in the United States, um, which lets us be on the bleeding edge. I think that these companies uh, internationally will uh, quickly start to benefit from these tools as well. Okay. Yeah, we personally haven't seen a difference. Um, around twenty percent of our of our customers are outside of the U.S. targeting the U.S., which you know totally works with us. Um, and yeah, I think it just it's less than you know the the U.S. because we're just based in the U.S. We've been marketing in the U.S. Um, yeah, don't see much of a difference. Okay, brilliant. So let me st stop digging on this one. Um, the other question is another sort of difference. Do you see any difference between um, someone trying to target physical, you know, selling physical product versus services product? I think this one's for you, Christopher. Sorry, Christopher is one of four user. He asked the question and got it. Whoever wants it, yeah, to go, if it, you know, can answer. <laughs> if, if I can jump on that, this is Ryan here. Um, you know, I think a service based product is. So, all right, two parts of this. First, I don't think it matters um, if your next step is, is clearly defined in the email, right? So if it's a physical product and I, and I say to you, hey, would you like to, buy, you know, in, in a cold email, if I, if I offered to sell you a coffee cup and give you a link to go and buy it um, and, you, and, and you didn't request my email, I could get into some hot water uh, through can spam, right? I, I just violated one of their... Um, one of the requirements. However, um, it's a lot harder for me to say, hey, can we set up 10 minutes to talk about how you drink coffee? And, and for you to actually think that, that, that my request is genuine, right? It's a little bit, so, so I, don't think that, I don't think there's a difference if you do it correctly, right? Now, if I invited you to a webinar I was hosting with some of the top coffee brewers and, and that, like, and because you're an avid coffee drinker, that, that, that might be a first step. Right, so it doesn't matter there. Where it does matter is, um, I think a service product, um, with regards to getting to that next step of getting a meeting or you know getting a demo set up or something, um, when done correctly and and in a compliant manner, um, meaning your emails are set up so that they're not in violation of can spam. I think it's it's easier to do that for a you know, for a, a B2B business or, or for a service-based business than it is for, like I said, someone who um, sells personalized coffee mugs. I'll comment on uh, one piece of this, which is that I think that a lot of the same principles apply, um, but that you're going to have a hard time selling certain categories of product um, based on the value of that customer via outbound techniques. Um, if you're selling a $10 coffee mug, um, list building for individual coffee cup purchasers is probably not the most effective way to go and sort of cold emailing them. Um, the better approach that we've seen is for people to look at basically aggregators or distributors of consumer products and target them. So maybe you'll target restaurants or uh, maybe you'll target cutlery vendors or something like that. Um, however, if you are selling consumer products, um, inbound techniques are tried and true and they work really well. Um, actually getting your list together so make lots of content good SEO um, and engage with those customers and then when you add outbound to that mix making sure that those outbound people are going to bring you enough customers in aggregate to justify the time you spend emailing with them and then when they reply positively to engaging with them um, the cutoff that we see uh, that we recommend and we've done the, the back of the envelope math is that if you're selling a product that's worth more than two thousand in lifetime value of that customer then great. You can definitely get great value out of doing outbound targeted email. And if you're not, if you're doing something that's less than a few thousand, then you should be looking at groups of customers um, who can bundle together via some sort of um, aggregator distributor to do your engagement with or look at inbound techniques. So 
So for example, if I'm selling bikes, um, what you're saying is like, I shouldn't actually contact the consumer who will actually buy my bike, but actually the vendors who will then, you know, sell multiple bikes. That's basically the idea behind it. That's right. And that's just a question of math, right? If you're contacting a hundred people you think might want to buy bikes and, you know, two of those people actually buy bikes, um, then you've sort of wasted a lot of people's time and wasted a lot of your own time in, in spurious conversations for not a lot of cash. Um, now, if you're talking about communicating with, say, um, Target and Walmart and other people who are mass reselling bikes, then each one of those guys is going to bring you a lot of consumers, um, which is a better approach for outbound. But that said, if you're selling bikes on a regular basis and you have a blog about bikes and people sign up to your blog and they to the trusted advisor for blog data, then you can get a good list that is less time consuming for you. Um, but you get much bigger deals from doing outbound. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a fundamental difference in terms, you know, in terms of list building. Obviously, in terms of selling, there are huge differences, but the question focuses on list building. Um, taking, you know, anecdotal evidence, taking a look at like the last 20 people who've signed up for Lion Leads, it, it looks like it's pretty much half and half. Um, so yeah, I don't see a difference. I think, you know, just like Anon mentioned, it, it just comes down to, you know, ROI. You know, how much is it going to cost you to reach, reach out to these people and, how, and what, can, what kind of conversion rate can you expect? That's, that's really the only number that matters. So do you guys actually do only, so Mike, you're, you're sort of hinting that you also provide some uh, B2C capabilities in terms of building lists. Um, Anon and Ryan, do you guys also target consumer instead of, um, instead of uh, B2B only? Generally, no, we are um, almost exclusively B2B. The only exception that I'll say is when you have a category of consumer, who, because of their profile, looks a lot like a business. A typical example is somebody who is, um, say, a doctor, right? Um, where they're they're coming in into contact with, uh, or they're they're becoming a prospect for us in their professional capacity, as opposed to as an individual consumer. So, for example, if you're selling um, surgical equipment to a hospital, um, yeah, a doctor may be the buyer, but they are not necessarily um, you know, we're not selling them copy buns. So we're generally B2B only. Got it. B2B for us. Yeah, same here. Yeah, same here. Anyway, so, <laughs> so guys. There's a market thanks. opportunity for someone out there. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, everyone, I mean, some people <laughs> tried on QuickMail to do a B2C. They fail miserably. They get marked as spam. And, you know, people don't like that. It's, I think it's genuine. There is a genuine case in B2B where you're actually, you know, trying to develop business relationship with other people who got it uh, versus, you know, annoying people with, you know, just the typical advertising that everyone used to call spam, really. Anyway, so um, you guys, uh, obviously, we don't have Sam anymore. Um, I'm pretty, pretty sad about this uh, because the input from Sam was pretty great so far. But anyway, if you guys want to ask any questions specifically to Anand, Mike, and Ryan, I think we still got five or ten minutes. Um, so um, you go to chat.quickmail.io and then you you mention your question there. I know there is a few, there is quite a few of you already there. So if you have any questions, then just go for it. Meanwhile, do you guys want to say something special? I mean. I haven't given you really a chance to sort of sell your product or really talk about it. Do you actually want to do that? Okay, I'm going to have to name someone. So let's start with Anon again. <laughs> well, sure. So, um, you know, my goal here is to, to give some useful content to folks, not, not try and pitch you on our services, but um, I'll give you, in the interest of uh, understanding what we do, a little context. Um, feel free to get in touch with us. We uh, run the gamut of um, sales stack services. Um, you can either take your existing tools and plug them into ours, or you can buy these services from us directly. We have a product that does lead generation at scale, um, meaning we find businesses in any demographic. You can filter by technology, you can filter by region, you can filter by firm. Um, you can get specialized stuff like job descriptions or really specialized stuff um, that you need a human being to go out and research, and we have infrastructure lets us go and grab that information at large scale. Um, we find contact data as well. Um, we guarantee the accuracy of all the data that we provide to our customers. 
Um, we also do data enrichment campaigns. So if you're buying lists from some other vendor and you don't like the, the data or the data is kind of messy, then you put that into our system and we'll basically add in whatever information you need to make that data high performing. Um, of course, the last thing is that um, we plug into a lot of tools and services like uh, Yesware, Tout, and QuickMail um, in terms of letting our leads flow into those systems. Um, and we have operated them on behalf of our customers to sort of set up effective outbound campaigns. Um, we also have our own email tool that plugs into our own product as well. Sure. I mean, you know, I'll keep it short as well. I, I, I don't really, you know, I'm not here just to sell line leads to you guys. Um, but yeah, you know, we are a really new startup. Um, right now, you know, the best thing we can do is you come to our site and segment, um, segment some customers um, and export a bunch of their data. And we, you know, we're sort of like a big improvement over like data and Hoover's. Um, you know, we guarantee accuracy, guarantee email deliverability, uh, instantly verify everything along the way. Um, some interesting things, we have a product that's in closed beta called Customer Match, and you can get there by going to LimeLead slash Customer Match, and it's about 100 times fancier than anything else we've built so far. Um, the idea there is that we plug in your CRM, suck in all of your existing customers, and then use machine learning models to find uh, similar customers. Um, so we've been getting a little bit of press for that, um, and I think our entire company is going to move in that direction shortly. So yeah, I, I, I definitely recommend signing up for the beta. Um, it's, it's totally free. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Lime Leads in a nutshell. Thanks again for having us. Thanks, Jeremy. No worries. Do you want to also have a quick go, uh, Ryan? And then I got a couple of questions for all you guys. Yep, sure thing. Um, for the folks who are still on the chat, I just uploaded a PDF doc. Um, about a minute ago, so feel free to grab that um, as an attachment and download it. There's no viruses or anything in there. Um, it's a great PDF on cold emailing, kind of setting up your system, so uh, dig into that. I think for the folks who are still on this call, um, if you've liked what you've heard, um, I don't think that it's too far of a stretch to, to go out and, you know, I know that, that Lime Leads has, a, has a, an option to, to create a free account and get some free leads. Um, you can create a free account on CellHack and get some free leads. Um, uh, as far as Lead Genius is concerned, you can at least get a free demo. Anon, if you can get free leads or test something. You actually well, can't get free leads. Yeah, okay. go ahead and, and uh, just fill out, the, fill out the embedded free form. We'll run you through our profiler and shoot you over a sample of leads. All right, um, you can also see the, yeah. <laughs> right on. Um, so anyone on this call, you, you, you've got three companies here that if you're not using any of us, or if you're using one of us, you're probably doing yourselves a disservice by not checking out the other two or checking out all three. Um, I think Jeremy's done a pretty good job at, at, at you know, there's a ton of options out there. Um, he's at least, you know, unless I was the, the 12th person that he invited because he had uh, nine other uh, rejections or cancellations. I, I think the fact that the three of us are here is at least a testament to the fact that, you know, um, what we've built at least, you know, if it doesn't have the endorsement of Jeremy, um, you know, it's at least it, it, we have solid products, right? Um, one of our, you know, one of our products and services might be better for your particular business, um, or a combination of the three of ours might work out. But you're doing yourselves a, a you would do yourselves a great service to check out each company, um, see what they're offering and, and what would work best for um, your process. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, the one question I've seen and um, it comes back to when Anand you were saying, you were talking about you know the sort of opening job position trick in, in order to figure out if a company may be interested into expanding in certain areas. Um, some people are mentioning, you know, can you give us some list crawling tricks? Uh, another one mentioned that, you know, how about if, you know, the market is already saturated and, you know, 100 people already got the same leads. Do you sort of got some um, advice for people trying to build their list and and some of the technique or some, some um, ideas on how to get the most out of it, shall I say? Not sure if I'm asking a right a good question there, but it's basically: Do you have any idea on how to get you know to extract list yourself and, and not relying on inbound but on outbound? And what are the risk of you know getting into a saturated market already? So you have to be. So there's not. Yeah. 
The number one question here is basically figuring out what your unique buying signal is or buying trigger is. Job descriptions are a great one, but it may vary depending on your industry. It could be a news event that precipitates your sale. It may be something like a, um, you know, we see in the solar industry that um, the presence of uh, open space on somebody's roof um, is a great trigger, and that's something you can find publicly as well. Now, the key thing here is knowing what that is, figuring out that there is some way that you can get that data, and then potentially maybe just doing it in a way that doesn't scale in the beginning, um, just grabbing that data and, and dropping it in and proving to yourself that it actually converts. You generally have to mention this fact in your outbound email um, when you're reaching out to them to actually capitalize on it. Then once you verify that it actually works, okay, then you can figure out this question, how do I do it automatically and at scale? Um, and there's some data that you just can't get automatically. Um, and that's where tools like ours come in, where you come to a company like us and say, hey, here's this really obscure piece of data that um, I need to get off of my plate and into something that reproduces um, this data automatically. Um, but um, the, the most important thing is figuring out what that actual relevant data point is. Because until you find that out, um, grabbing the data is sort of the least of your concerns. Knowing what your customers are actually buying based on is a much more immediate question to answer. Ryan, Mike, do you got any suggestion on how people can build their list? Concrete with example, like Anand just did with the solar industry. I think that was great. Thanks. Yeah, so I mean, I can just talk about some, you know, recent customers. Um, you know, the yoga studio is one of our earliest customers. So again, like they, um, you know, it, it depends on who your who your customer profile is. If it's something as simple as like we know we sell to every yoga studio in the U.S. because you know those are who our customers are, then you can use a tool like ours, and you're pretty much done in about five minutes. Um, but mo more like you know, much more likely, um, you're going to need more data, um, more, you know, sort of like uh, some key information on these on these individuals, um, you, you know, to determine whether or not they're good customers. And then that comes down to like, you know, can you use a tool like ours? Um, do you have to hire, can you do it yourself? Um, can you hire a bunch of virtual assistants? Can you go to Lead Genius, right? Um, so, I mean, that's that's pretty much what it takes. I, I just agree wholeheartedly with Anon that it, it really comes down to, to nailing your customer profile first. Yeah, and my quick comment on this is, you know, if what you're currently doing, so based off of whatever your, your current process is, chances are you're going to find a tool or a product or a service out there that will be able to complement that. Um, I think the, the three folks that are uh, still on this call, um, you know, Mike and Anand and myself, all have different flavors of helping you get to the same and the same output, the same the same end end goal, which is you know a list of names and bits of contact information and 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 some other things, right? But depending on your process, you know we each might attack it from a slightly different angle. So it, you know a lot of it is just you know which one fits the best with your business, and and you know either changing what you're doing and and trying something different or finding something that's more complementary. To what your existing process is that you know just needs to be made more efficient to help you you know uh, keep your pipeline full fantastic so one of the key takeaway i i get is really to nail down a sub segment of a sub segment of a sub segment kind of thing so you really make sure that you're targeting the real people that will have the highest chance of buying then uh, another interesting point uh, I figured as well is you have to do it like manually initially and not trying to scale straight away. And then after that, you can think of scaling and you have a whole range of tools uh, to your disposal. Did I sort of summary right? I think, I think that's spot on. You know, if you really nail down that sub-segment that has a high chance of converting, you can afford to invest a lot more uh, money into, you know, the mm. individual outreach. Um, and instead of just being able to afford, you know, an email blast, you can then afford to hire people and scale out, you know, ca calling them and following up and, and, and doing live demos like this, right? Which isn't possible if you have a, you know, 0.001% conversion rate. So it makes total sense. Um, guys, if you, if you have a last comment, then you can go for it.
And uh, if not, I just want to thank you very, very much for spending the hour with me. I think uh, um, there was a lot of really good nuggets into here. I'm going to try to put this into a, a big video and hopefully release it um, this week or, in, or the following one. And um, awesome. yeah, just uh, just want to thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the great questions and thanks to uh, Jeremy and the QuickMail team for putting this together. Fantastic. I'm going to stay a five, uh, five, ten more minutes on the chat. You guys can stay as well. I'm just going to stop the uh, the webinar. So if anyone has any questions specifically for Anand, uh, uh, Ryan, or, or Mike, then uh, you guys, you know, can just go ahead and then just uh, grill them even more. Thanks again. I really appreciate, guys.